everyone and welcome to Empowering Homeschool Conversations. We're so glad that you are with us tonight. And if you're joining us live, we'd love for you to um, to share with anybody else that you would think that um, would want to be part of this conversation. Tonight we're talking about transitioning, which means can you get your child ready for what they need to be ready for? And how do you do that? And how do you plan for that? And this is kind of the, this is the last week um, in the month of February, and we've been focusing on IEPs. And usually that's part of what the IEP plan is. But my guests tonight are gonna let you know that <clears throat> instead of just the, the typical, let's start planning at 14, that we maybe should start a little earlier. <laughs> so even if you don't have students who are towards high school age, this is going to be a great conversation for you to join in on. And so um, so make sure that you um, just share this and um, continue watching because we'd, we'd love for you to be um, part of this conversation. Definitely put your comments, questions in the feed. And so um, so I want to introduce my, my guests tonight. Um, Brandy Timmons and Wendy Dawson are um, from Social Motion Skills, and they're going to explain uh, a bit about that um, and what they do there and uh, but they are partners with Sped Homeschool and um, I've known them for a long time and they just have hearts that want to help parents and that's what they're all about so and and their kids too so so welcome ladies I'm so glad to have you with us um, thank you for taking time um, out of your crazy schedules you both live in Houston as I do and it's been a crazy week for all of us so I appreciate you taking some time to uh, be part of, of our show so um, we are thrilled to be here and um, as Peggy said we are longtime supporters of the homeschool network and I'm actually the set mom um, to a almost 26 year old son now who um, was diagnosed with autism when he was two. So mm -hmm. this whole topic of transition and movement towards independence and um, just preparing them really for an independent life um, that we want as parents that we feel comfortable in, that they can succeed and um, preparing them for the life that they are able to embrace and be confident in and um, succeed in really is near and dear to our heart. So, and um, yeah. Brandy and I talk about this every day and I come in and I was like, oh my gosh, this happened last night and how do we solve this challenge and how do we mm -hmm. teach this lesson? And, you know, I was like, you're not gonna believe this happened. And we're like, oh yeah, that's typical, typical. So how do we break this down and how do we solve this? So it's very much, um, it's just what, us mommies do you know we're right. really blessed in kind of this blended world of being a mom and educator and and mm -hmm. business owners and um so i really peggy as i always say i really hope that um what my family has gone through what our company has gone through in our evolution mm -hmm. um, is able to bring resources and kind of a window to the world um, for the families who follow behind us in this path. Yeah, so true. Yeah, yeah. And um, I also want to thank Bookshark. They um, are our sponsor for this episode of Empowering Homeschool Conversations. And we're going to hear more from them as we, um, about halfway through this broadcast. So I want to thank Bookshark for that, that sponsorship and allowing this broadcast to happen um, and to come to you for free. So, um, and we are broadcasting live right now on YouTube, on Facebook, and on Periscope. So, um, so ladies, with, before we get started, um, I would just like you, I know Wendy, you, you already um, talked a little bit about yourself, but but I would love for you to share um, both your, just your heart for um, for families and, and how that came about, just a little bit of your background, and um, and then what you do at, um, at your business. And, and I know we're going to talk about a new program you have, too, um, a little bit later on. So, so yeah, um, I don't know who wants to start, but I'll let you fight over that. <laughs> um. Go ahead. Also, and then I'll um, give it over to Brandy. So, um, yes, I married my husband about 20 years ago. I kind of can't believe that. And then with him came two children, um, a daughter who's about to get married next year. And um, this amazing child who was four when I met him, he had about a 40-word vocabulary 
because I just said he's been diagnosed on the autism spectrum at about two. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know what it meant to parent. Um, obviously, I didn't have children. I really, really just honestly had no clue. Um, hmm. you know, there was a file in the file cabinet, but, um, you know, I think, I mean, this was 20 years ago, right? So parents were still very much in denial and you're like, well, this autism thing, you grow out of it or mm-hmm. we can do therapies and, um, you know, just, we're just going to ignore it and we'll do speech therapy and everything's going to be fine. Right. So, um, yeah. of course that's not the case, which no. is fine because, um, we have this most amazing young man in our lives every day now whom we love and has taught us so much as a family. And mm. since we're kind of in a, in a family situation tonight, I think one of the most amazing things um, is how Cameron is his name has changed our family for the better. And yeah. for us as parents um, and also raising two kids who came after him because mm-hmm. it's given us the ability to help our children really understand, you know, what does learning differences look like? What mm-hmm. does disability look like? What does diversity and inclusion look like? And it's something that we hold very near and dear to our heart and I really think that our family has benefited from this and that yeah. Randy knows I tell my kids all the time. I was like, you know, you guys are the leaders of the world that are coming and you've got to understand that not everybody thinks like you and, mm-hmm. and be able to recognize um, different thinkings and the talents that your brother has because he has many. And right. be patient and quiet and calm and listen to him and think because he really brings a different perspective to the world. And so for that, mm-hmm. we're um, definitely proud and, and blessed. Um, mm-hmm. So that's okay. kind of a journey. I mean, you know, you're married into this and um, we're, we're raising all these kids through school and all four of our kids, um, you know, everybody's very different. They've got different school paths. And so I think one of our our, I don't know, I guess um, the things that we think about every day and that we explain is that even amongst our kids, it's not everybody has the same path. And what was mm-hmm. what was right for Cameron's big sister was not necessarily right for him. And what was right for him is not necessarily right for the younger siblings that follow. Right. And so it's kind of leading into this whole conversation of transition and what mm-hmm. is transition look like? And it's, it's different for every child and every family, but, and um, you know, jumping ahead to the topics, um, it's really what I think spurred us to realize that we needed to create a company. We could, we founded Social Motion ten years ago because there was no place in the community to teach social skills. So there were special schools and there were therapists and mm-hmm. um, um, I guess uh, I don't know. <laughs> but we couldn't find what we wanted. So it was like, I guess right. we, we so have like a good to... mom. You, you create what you need. <laughs> <laughs> kind of that, uh, mama bear kicks in. Right. Right. Um, mm-hmm. And so that's what we said about doing 10 years ago was creating a safe place where these individuals primarily on the autism spectrum, because that's what we knew that was the problem mm-hmm. we were trying to solve. Um, but also those with similar, um, differences where they could come and connect and find community and get the social skills training that they needed and um, have a place where that evolves. So mm-hmm. we actually started with a really small group in a church at about the tween age level, about age 12. We grew that and then younger parents were coming to us and saying, well, how do we, how do we get this training? Because um, mm-hmm. we hope that our teens um, have this training by the time that we get there because we see how beneficial this is. Mm-hmm. So that was kind of the evolution. So um, now we work with about, I don't know, 200 individuals a mm-hmm. week, um, ages four to 54. And wow. um, the kind of just, um, I guess my, my happy place is knowing that I'm a mom in this community. We live this life. We walk this mm-hmm. life this life we are raising a family and we're like so many families and we just we lay it down and we lay it out there and we're ready to learn and 
um, the biggest part is share our resources. And I've never been more blessed yeah. than when Randy joined our team because she's the brain behind this is what you need and this is what you're talking about and this is how we solve these issues. And so uh, I just really feel blessed that we have been able to create this resource for our community. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's it, like, yeah, you said there there was nothing 20 years ago, because that's about the time that my son was diagnosed. And, and yeah, we, like I said, there was maybe two books that existed on autism, and you're, you're as a parent going, what do you do? And so, um, so yes, so so thankful that there's so many more resources and resources like which, what um, you guys do at Social Motion Skills. So, so what about you, Brandy? <laughs> um, I've been with Social Motion for about believe it or not, almost four years now. Um, so I have been um, in the education field for about 20 years now. I started out as a public school teacher working with um, kids of all different disabilities. So I've worked with um, everyone from early childhood through um, young adults. So there's not much that I haven't seen. Been there, done that. Um, <laughs> fell, in, <laughs> fell in love with kids um, with autism many, many, many years ago and just... Um, love figuring out the different strategies that work for them because so many of our kids it's not a matter of things that they can't do it's just giving them the tools and the strategies and helping parents understand how to how to teach their kids and how to how to you know use those strategies at home not just at school so um, about six years ago i decided to go back to school and became a board certified behavior analyst um, and have really been able to use that at social motion to help build some of the programs that we have and um, just to increase the knowledge that our parents have, um, which is what we really want to talk about tonight um, with transition. You know, we have a really unique perspective at Social Motion because we do serve a lifespan of kids. So wow. we have the young adults that come through and we get to see um, those barriers that they face mm -hmm. when they try to um, you know, reach independence and try to um, gain employment. And right. we kind of know where you're headed, no matter what point you come in to us. So if you come in as a four-year-old, we can kind of tell you where you're going and what you need to do to get there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Because now, like the public schools, like I, I had said when we got started, they, they have like, it's called a transition plan that mm -hmm. usually they start around age 14. And, um, and yet, what I'm hearing from you is that's not the best approach. <laughs> so, so what? How should parents look at this and and say, you know, we we want to to help our children to be able to transition to you know whatever skills they need, you know, into life, into maybe even just the next set of school years. Um, but um, how do they go about that? What is what is a, a good, I guess, mindset to come into that with? Um, kind of interesting question. I think I'll let Brandy delve into the details after this, but um, one of the biggest things that we've realized is independence is really a process. Mm -hmm. And it's not something that um, starts at age 18 or age 14. And that's really been one of the um i think biggest mindsets um problems that we saw when our own child was in high school is mm -hmm. the delayed attention or the delayed approach to transition like you're thinking all of a right. sudden you graduated 18 and you've got all these skills well mm -hmm. since of course that's what we pay attention to all all the time we know that that's really not true Right. We've really um, kind of made conscious and intentional and very purposeful focus on backing transition planning up to as early as possible. Mm -hmm. And it's so interesting because um, Cameron's a good 10 years older than our other kids. And so having him grow up alongside the younger siblings, it's like, okay, well, you have skills and you need to be part of the operation of this family. That's our words mm -hmm. in our family. So uh -huh. it's, Everything from setting the table to cleaning up the dishes to cleaning your room to walking the dog to bringing in the mail to whatever it takes to be involved in the operation of the family. Mm -hmm. And it was really interesting because 
we had age differences, we had kind of cognitive differences, right. um, but you know what? Everybody can participate and that's mm. what it takes. And so my biggest thing is we always um, try to dole out those responsibilities appropriately and um, mindfully so that all the kids felt empowered and responsible and important, but also mm. that they were learning. And um, we'll come back. One of the big things Brandon and I talk about all the time is life does not happen by magic. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you don't start embracing that idea and teaching your kid that life doesn't happen by magic as early, and I would even throw it out there as early as like four, mm -hmm. that they grow up and they don't know. I mean, right. how can they not know? Because if everything happens for them and everything's done for them, then my golly, life does happen by magic. You know, I got food on the table. I got clean clothes in the closet. I mean, my bathroom is clean. Right. Not exactly. Life, mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. I mean, so Brandy, why don't you add some details to that? That's kind of, it's kind of the big picture of mm -hmm. where we come from and why transition is so important. Yeah. Completely. One of the big things that we talk to our parents about all the time, it's kind of a theme for everything that we do is presuming confidence with our kids. So a lot of, um, yes. you know, a lot of times your parents, they get a diagnosis and then they automatically assume, well, there's so many things my kids can't do. But, mm -hmm. you know, there's, when you're teaching and you're working in a school district um, with your paraprofessionals, you're teaching them to start at the top and back up. So assume that they can do everything that everybody else can do and then if they need a little bit of help, you can back up and start providing that, that support because our school systems usually work backwards. They usually start at the bottom right. mm -hmm. and they break it down and start with one task and then move up. But a lot of our kids aren't missing so much the whole skill. They're missing little splinter pieces. And so if you yeah. assume competence and assume mm -hmm. that they can do a task with the needed support, then you're going to make a whole lot more progress. So that's kind of an, just an overarching principle that we use with everything that we do. And we try to get our parents to understand that. Um, and like Wendy was saying, there's so many things that parents can be doing um, just on a day-to-day -day basis to teach transition and build transition skills so that when they hit that magic number of 14 or 16 <laughs> or 18, you don't have to be stressed and worried, right. did I do everything that needed to be done? Yeah. So. And I can see how positive that that plays towards a child, too, who you're saying, I know that you have in you what need, you need to do this task. There may be little pieces missing. You know, mm -hmm. how much better does that make them feel than you to approach them and say, well, you can't do this. So here's how we're going to plan this out for you. So um, I can see that being extremely empowering to the child as well and, and making them want to be at that level of, of um, competence as well. You know, Peggy, it's so interesting because um, my child is now almost 26 and um, he has gone away to college, graduated mm -hmm. from um, Texas Tech and is now back living at home with a full-time job and a girlfriend. And so I say that because I love to be, I think a, a beacon of, I guess, hope or mm -hmm. positiveness that you know what? your child is going to do more than you ever thought that they could do. Exactly. The reason I say that is because um, you never stop skill building. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting because all the little steps along the way add up to what they need to be able to move out independently. Mm -hmm. Because now my son wants more than anything to move out to his own apartment. Um, he, he lived um, with college roommates, but they still had a meal plan and they still had um, the classes go to everything, every mm -hmm. day, and everything was pretty much pre um, prescribed. But now, you know what, we're realizing that there there's gaps in his understanding and mm -hmm. um, every day, it's not only understanding, but it's stamina because he's working a full-time mm -hmm. job. Mm -hmm. And we know, we as parents know, it is so hard to wake up in the morning prepare those lunches, um, mm -hmm. prepare the dinner that night, go to work all day, 
come home, make dinner, you know, wash the dishes, do everything that you have mm-hmm. to do. It takes a lot of stamina. Right. So that in itself is part of the transition mm-hmm. building so that they have the skills and they understand what it takes yeah. so that the day that they are ready, that they mm-hmm. are motivated, they have the desire and the capability, and we want to fulfill that dream mm-hmm. that they are able and have the skills to be able to move out and live on their own. Yeah, and then, um, exactly. Do it in a week. Mm-hmm. I guess that's no. what we're that's what we're preaching here is you cannot do it in a week. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> or even a couple of years. Right. Yeah. It, right. That's so true. Yeah. Well, yeah, I I wholeheartedly agree, and yes, I, my son is in the same place at 24. Yeah. So graduated from college and um, is home working full time. Right. Doesn't have a girlfriend. I don't think he ever wants one. But that's a whole nother story. Oh, that's, that's, a whole that's a whole nother webcast, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, he's quite quite content. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, so what would you say are some ways that parents and teachers work against helping students? gain independence that maybe they don't even know that they're doing and how can they keep just what they're doing makes a student almost dependent on them and i know i'm probably guilty of it myself (laughs) but um are there some that you've seen you know that um more so than others in working with families Yeah, one of the biggest things that we see in our kids, um, and it's so easy to do to them, um, is teaching them learned helplessness. Um, Learned helplessness is kind of a concept that comes from um, providing support to our kids, which, of course, they need. But what happens is we start providing them that support, but we never fade the support away. So we don't ever really give them the opportunity to do things on their own. Mm -hmm. Um, Another thing that we do sometimes, we do quite often actually, is we give them support before they really have had a chance to try. So it's, Mm. you know, as a parent, especially, that could be really difficult to sit back and let your child, you know, struggle a little bit. Let them them, Mm -hmm. um, try first before you step in and provide that support. Um, it goes against everything in us. Um, it's, it does. It's a skill you have to teach. I had to, when I worked with paraprofessionals, that was something we worked on all the time. Mm. It was like, okay, stop, give them a minute, let them think about it. Let them try first and then step in. And then, um, prompt fading is knowing that if you've provided like let's say you're doing a, a demonstration of a skill and you're providing some hand hand over hand um, work to help them with the task. Well, once they do it correctly, the next time they try, don't do that much support. Just give them some verbal support and see if they can do it on their own. And then once they've done that, then back off a little bit more. Maybe you don't need to give them verbal support. Let's just point to some things and show them some steps. So there's really some conscious things that we can do and in very intentional ways that we can help them not to become dependent on us. Mm. Yeah. I think um, there's also a lot of, um, through your actions, you build self-esteem and you teach these uh, kids that yes. you are valuable and they mm-hmm. are worthy and they are competent and they are mm-hmm. smart in their own ways. Um, because you know what, whether we like it or not, they struggle all the time with why am I different? Why do I have to have special ed? Why do I have to have tutors? You know, yeah. if I'm so smart, why is this mm-hmm. so hard for me? But you right. know what, your actions at home, basically treating them as normal and teaching them the steps to do does a lot to, to build up their, their core and yeah. um, their self-esteem, mm-hmm. um, they have to believe in themselves. They have to believe <clears> in <throat> mm-hmm. that they are smart and that they can learn and um, that they can fail. I mean, like what Brandy's saying yes. is all of our kids do this. I mean, and mm-hmm. I've got such the perfect visual in front of me every day with, you know, my kiddo on the spectrum and then my neurotypical kids here too. But it's like, we wouldn't do that to our other kids. It's like, oh, well, mm go try to bake brownies and you know 
if you put a tablespoon of salt in the recipe instead of the teaspoon of salt, oh well, next time you'll you'll realize that happens. But we, I think our instincts are to overprotect, and mm-hmm. what that mm-hmm. does inadvertently is teach them that we don't trust them, that they're not yeah. capable, that they're not able. Um, mm-hmm. So, like a perfect example, you know, uh, is reading the mail. Mail is hard. You get lots of junk mm-hmm. mail. And you mm-hmm. get fake mail and you get lots of mail that looks real. That's not really real. Mm-hmm. So instead of like, teach your kid how to read the mail and sort through what is junk mail and what is important. And I mean, you get all this stuff from insurance companies. And I've been a big believer. Don't hide reality from your children. Yes, you know, I so agree with that. Mm-hmm. Got to know basically what do things cost and what is the value proposition in that? Mm-hmm. And, um, when you go to the doctor, then you get follow-up paper and how do you take care of that? Mm-hmm. And, but anyway, this is an example in my mind is sorting through the mail. Of, instead of having them come and bring you the mail and say, well, here it is. It's like, well, has your name on it. It's about you open it, read it. Tell me what you think this is, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and it's, it's really important for them to take that ownership of their life. Yes. You know, yeah. mm-hmm. um, to be able to understand bank statements come in the mail, health insurance comes in the mail, mm-hmm. all registrations come in the mail. And I know we're probably talking down the road a little bit um, for some of these kids on in, in transition independence, but you know what? It's there before you know it. And if you are exactly. not, we're preaching tonight, if you're not starting as early as you can, Mm-hmm. learning these skills, even at the most basic level, by the time you get there, you have so much catching up to do. It's this yeah. really hard climb. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, as you're talking about that, Wendy, what it makes me think of is, you know, you're supposed to teach your kids when you sit, when you stand, when, you know, bring them with you. Don't just um, leave them at home all the time. And sometimes that's really, really difficult. Um, and it means that the shopping trip is going to take extra long and, mm-hmm. you know, all these other things that we do, but those are the environments that they have to eventually survive in. And if we aren't teaching them who is, um, and they aren't going to do well. So it's so true. Brady, well, you were going to add something to that? Yeah, there was one other thing that um, for your homeschoolers that are trying to build transition plans, one thing that they need to try to be really cognizant of, and of course, as a behavior analyst, I love data. So Uh uh there is something that's called the Goldilocks principle. And with the Goldilocks principle, you have to be really careful to make sure that you're not giving your kids tasks that are too hard. Because if you give them tasks that are too hard, they're going to get really frustrated. And you have to be careful not to give them tasks that are too easy or they're going to end up bored and not learning anything. So you need to make sure that your tasks are just right for your kids. They need to be things that they're capable of doing. They may have to have a little bit of help, but that's okay. But, mm-hmm. and the re- way that you find that is assessing your kids all the time. And that doesn't have to be anything hard. It's just mm-hmm. ask, them, you know, ask them to do a task and see how much of that they can do um, so that you know where they are, so that you know exactly what level that they're at. Um, so that's a really good way to keep them from becoming dependent on you and um, mm-hmm. learning helplessness. That's, that's a good point. Yeah. Well, we're at a really good point stopping point. Um, And so I'm going to give you guys a quick break and we're going to hear from our sponsor and then I'm going to bring you back and we're going to continue this conversation. Wendy and Brandy have a whole bunch more to share, I promise you. (laughs) So um, so I'm going to give you guys just a break off the camera and I'll have you back in just a second. But we are going to hear from our sponsor, Bookshark. And if You've never heard of Bookshark. Um, I'd love to introduce you to them. They are another one of our partners at um, Sped Homeschool, and they um, they have a curriculum that they want you to know about. So Bookshark is a homeschool curriculum. It's literature based. It's four day, faith neutral, and you can see more about them at Bookshark.com. But Kim McNary, a busy homeschool mom, says my daughter is on the spectrum as well as has OCD and has instantly taken to this curriculum. It's incredibly structured, which makes us both ecstatic. The books are great and the kids are awesome too. I'm running my daughter to all kinds of appointments and this curriculum fits in amazingly. We are first year Bookshark customers and happy as a lark. You know, Kim is right. 
Shark is fully planned. It's a four-day homeschool curriculum that flexes to match your busy lifestyle. The detailed instructor's guide lays everything out so clearly that you just prepare by opening it up in mere minutes, gather your resources and you go. Um, the curriculum is for ages four to 16 and it's available in all subject packages or in individual academic areas like reading with history, language arts, science, and math. With Bookshark's rich, literature rich curriculum, your child will read or have read to them 30 to 50 engaging books each year. Awesome. Visit bookshark.com to browse curriculum, download samples, and request a catalog. And we just want to thank you, Bookshark, for um, sponsoring this episode again. And um, also, if you want to see the curriculum, some of it, um, on our YouTube channel, we have an unboxing that um, one of our team members has done of one of their curriculum sets and also reviews. We're starting to do those on our website. And I wanna invite you, if you are interested, I'm gonna put in the description of this YouTube video, we have a new review crew. And if you wanna review curriculum and products and services of our partners, then um, we would invite you to do that um, by filling out an application. So, um, so thank you, Bookshark, and I'm going to, um, Let's see, figure out how to get that off there and bring Wendy and um, Brandy back. Um, I do want to let you know if you're watching with us live and I see we have some viewers that um, you can join us in this conversation. Definitely um, post your your um, comments, your questions. We would love for you to um, to be involved since we are live. That's what um, that's what we do. So um, so thank you, ladies, for that that break and for hanging around and so um so we've talked a little bit about the the what and the the why um how does a transition plan help with accomplishing student goals what and i mean we've talked a little bit of things but wendy you had said things just don't happen by magic mm -hmm. and i I, I want you guys to elaborate on that a little bit and um and how we can fall in that trap um and then also, how do we avoid it? And um, help our kids not to think that they can just um, do what Harry Potter does. <laughs> <laughs> and life will all turn out right, or <laughs> however. Oh my gosh, that's such a big loaded question. Um, so um, I think one of the, the biggest revelations I ever had is the difficulty that my son in our personal case um, has in problem solving. And mm. so things don't happen by magic, but even in your house with these kids and going back to teaching them the, the self-confidence and the self-worth and um, the belief in themselves to mm. ask questions and not to be ashamed and not to feel mm. like mm -hmm. they are compromised or that why shouldn't they ask questions? Because you know what? Everybody asks questions. And this is something I've really learned with mm -hmm. my um, 26 year old is for some reason he thinks, quote, normal people don't ask questions. And we're like, hmm. we ask questions all the time. But really working through that, that fear of weakness or that fear mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. exposing, I might not understand. Um, and helping them problem solve because Peggy, one of the things we fight the hardest against and Brandy can test, you know, be testimony to this is we can teach and teach all day long, but we cannot teach every possible scenario that life is going to throw to these kids. I mean, in exactly. a different place, a different environment, a different school with different people. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that what tools that we've used is kind of a problem solving flow chart. So I like my son to think about that. Can I solve this problem myself? First of all, you got to recognize you got a problem, right? When right. the toilet doesn't flush, when the wrong pizza doesn't, when the wrong pizza shows up, mm -hmm. then you don't have the right kind of socks to wear with long pants or short pants when you're out of shampoo. I mean, I can go on and on and on, right? Right. <laughs> There's a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do about them? You know, are you going to do nothing? Mm -hmm. Are you going to get mad? Are you going to go seek help? Is it something that you can solve yourself? Those are all really maturation step 
in this process. You know, mm-hmm. a four-year-old isn't going to be able to problem solve the way a 24-year-old. So let's right. give them the tools to think through those steps. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. That life doesn't happen by magic and life is work. I mean, I tell my kid all the time, it's called work because life is work and mm-hmm. it takes effort. And you, you've you got to make the effort to do this. And I'm, I'm going to throw it to Brandy now because the yeah. other thing we talked about <laughs> is um, taking the opinion and taking the guesswork out of transition. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so for all of our kids that come to us at Social Motion, I do an intake. So I meet the families, meet the kids and ask them different questions and try to get a feel of, you know, where the kid is, um, what kind of expectations the parents have from them at home. And one of the questions I always ask is, do you have a set list of chores at home? And they, invariably, every one of the teens will look at their parents like, uh, no, don't give me any. You know, <laughs> but about probably 90% of the kids that come through, they don't have any expectations at home. They don't have set chores. So a lot of those things that Wendy was talking about a minute ago, you know, the food on the table, the clean clothes in your drawers, you know, the towels and the washcloths that are in the bathroom. For those kids, it does happen by magic. They wake up Mm -hmm. and everything is done for them. So one of the biggest things that I think that parents can do um, that's really easy to build in is giving your kids those chores at an age appropriate level. And you can Google for chore list for developmentally appropriate. It's easy to find them. Mm -hmm. You'd be surprised at what some of the chores are on those lists. Um, And then as part of your transition planning, teach those skills every week. Set aside time every week to make sure that you're teaching your kids how to do those things. And not just teaching them how to do them, but relating them to real life. You know, why do you need to know how to do this? You know, um, the young, the 14 year old boy. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but so many of our kids, if they understand how it affects them personally, yes. they're more willing to learn. They're more willing to do that. So if, um, you know, if you have a 14 year old that wants to get married one day and you tell him that, you know, you're going to have to do the dishes sometimes, then um, he's going to be more likely to want to learn how to do that than he is just if you give it to him and say, you have to do this, you know. Um, so add, make sure you're teaching those things and make sure that you're having, again, presume competence, have those expectations for them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that. Peggy, again, with a really, really long focused lens, um, one of the things we have the benefit of seeing because we work with so many older individuals, young adults in their 30s, is that for those who didn't have the chance to build these precursory skills at like age 12 and 14 and 16. They're not doing summer jobs. They're not working for their parents. They're not, I mean, back in our days, we like mowed grass or walk dogs or, I mean, wash cars, whatever there was, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So a lot of our kids aren't having the chance to have these summer jobs and these little added tasks. So guess what else they are missing out on? Mm-hmm. Taking instructions, um, making sure that they do the full job to full completion, right? Right. Um, yeah. Taking feedback of like, wash the car. Oh, well, you missed a spot here. Mm-hmm. How does that make you feel? Right. And and so, mm-hmm. if our kids aren't learning these little jobs and little feedbacks and why they're important and why it's important mm-hmm. to the operation of the family. By the time they get to be 22 or 24 and they're trying to enter the workforce, they don't have the skills that they need. So what we see from all of our 30-year-olds is that the transfer of competencies, as I I like to call it, from those teenage years, from the school-supported years into the employment, the job environment, Hmm. it's not going to happen. And again, that's the next step. It doesn't happen by magic. So. Mm -hmm. Another of our little slogans is by making it too easy on them now, you simply make it harder on them later. Because it is almost so impossible mm-hmm. for these young adults to be 22, 24, to walk into a working environment, to an office environment, or, or to a job site, mm-hmm. never having had a job, never having had that feedback, having learned um, 
to make the effort when you don't want to, to do something right. that you don't want to because I don't like doing this. Well, guess mm -hmm. what? We all have to do things every day that we don't like to do. Want to do. How do you handle that frustration? How do you handle that um, comfortness? How, mm -hmm. how do you talk to your supervisor about, I really don't understand this. Mm -hmm. And so by going through what Brandy was saying, all of these building blocks, what you're doing really is enabling your child to be successful by the time they need it the next step in life. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. I always tell my kids the best thing that happened to you is we lived on a farm for five years and you had to feed yeah, animals yeah. and <laughs> yeah. you had to go out when it was 10 below and feed the right. animals. And <laughs> but mm -hmm. um, yeah, so um but yeah, there's there's chores you can do when you live in the city too. But um, mm -hmm. but yeah, they made them stronger. So for <laughs> what they are. So mm -hmm. as you know, kids are gaining independence. There is it possible that um, that they could look like they're more independent than they are, um, or mm -hmm. that they're they're covering up the the things that they should be learning, and um, and how do you deal with that? Very yeah, that's a big one. We see it a lot. Um, the term masking um, is what we see quite frequently, a lot of our, especially our young adults. Um, and usually that shows up um, when you ask them if they understand things. Oh, yeah, I got it. I'm good. I understand. I know how to do this. And then you give them a task and it's like, uh, no, you don't. <laughs> no, you don't. So um, you have to be really careful to make sure with um, with our guys, a lot of times asking them if they understand um, is not enough. Get them to repeat back to you. Get them to explain back to you what you've told them. Um, have them demonstrate for you what they're saying that they understand um, just to make sure that they really learned the concept, made sure that they really do understand um, what you've told them. Um, Wendy can tell you some stories about that in just a second. Um, but one of the other things as far as um, for our parents, it's really important for you to remember to teach your kids to do things to mastery. And I just want to throw that in real quick. Yes. Um, so you know, a lot of people, you know, you talk about – actually more than just to mastery you want to teach things to fluency so when you're teaching to master they've shown you that they've got it a couple of times but when you teach something to fluency they don't have to think about it anymore and so when you're teaching these skills and when you're doing these things make them demonstrate make sure that you're teaching it until you can see that they they've really got it so they're not able to mask those things um, because the masking can cause a lot of problems in a lot of situations. Yeah. So you got some examples, um, Wendy. <laughs> some point on that, um, the older the kids get, the better maskers they are and the bigger the problems it causes. Mm. Because, yeah. um, you know, if they're 12 and they're masking that they know how to make up a bed or put a book cover on a book or do a presentation, okay, fine. But they're 24 in the workforce, mm -hmm. and I got this, um, but they really don't know how to create the Excel spreadsheet that they have been asked to do. Um, right. There's a lot more, life gets a lot more serious and complicated really mm -hmm. fast when you're not able to own up. Again, I go back to that self-esteem to be able to say, you know what? I'm so sorry. Could you just show me exactly what you mean? Or can you explain? Mm -hmm. um, can I just be sure what you're asking me to do? Um, giving them that the tools to take that mask off with healthy self-esteem is, is so important because, um, you know, they're going to fake it till they make it because they don't want to be called out. They don't want mm -hmm. um, negative attention drawn to them. But at the end of the day, um, people are going to lose patience or mm -hmm. they are going to change their opinion really quickly. And, um, it just never ends up good when there's not honest communication about what those skills are. Right. And the anxiety and all the other things that come mm -hmm. with that. Right. <laughs> so, so yeah, so true. Yeah. My daughter called me out on masking because I, I have autistic tendencies and she's like, mom, I know when you are doing it. <laughs> 
<laughs> so it's like, oh yeah. <laughs> but you like you said, you learn to be good at it when when you need to use it. So that's right. Yeah. <laughs> so when you're looking at, at a student's ability to transition on their own as a lifelong learning skill, what is the most important core skill? And I think you already touched on this a little bit, um, Wendy, but it all boils down to <laughs> problem solving. Definitely. Yeah. And and I'm assuming, you know, that's something you just work on consistently is helping them walk through that process. Yeah. Can you it down to a flow chart? I mean, I don't know if it's um just kind of the way my brain works, but um it was just a very simple visual and thought process of a one, two, three, because our kids are already overwhelmed mm. in those situations. And um, so, you know, I think you just have to think about what is, you know, what works for you and your child um, in problem solving situations. But for me, it's stop and think about, recognize I have a problem. I don't know what to do and I'm okay with that fact. Okay, you, it, mm. like, hey, you gotta mm. admit, you gotta admit, I got a problem. So now what am I going to do about it? Right. And um, mm -hmm. can I solve it by myself? Okay. That's going to take effort. Let's make the effort to call somebody or walk downstairs or go, you know, go ask somebody what you need. If you really don't know how to solve it by yourself, then who is the go-to person? Mm -hmm. And that's what we can do as, as support caregivers is always let that let these people know who do you go to when you really need help it's totally okay to ask for help who's got your back i mean we've all got somebody who's got our back right mm -hmm. that's part of life um so go ask for help and say i don't understand this or i'm confused or um so the ability to recognize that you have a problem figure out can you solve it by yourself and maybe try and if you and if you fail that's okay but at least you tried I tried mm -hmm. to do this and then it didn't work and then go find somebody but um that to me is is the lifelong um kind of game changer because every day every point of the day um it's nothing but problems whether it's in communications with somebody whether it's mm -hmm. actually physically taking care of a household whether it's in a job um that skill of working through problems is huge. Yeah. And yeah. a lot of parents don't realize there's a really specific strategy that you can use to teach um, problem solving. So you can start with your little ones and it's actually by sabotaging situations. So when you're doing activities, instead of giving them all the steps, forget one and make them have to figure out what that step is. So you work on problem solving when the, yeah. Well, you work on it when there's not really a problem is the big mm -hmm. thing. So you start teaching that and you can do that really well with all of your little ones. Um, so that's definitely a big skill that can start, you know, as soon as they're, as soon as you're ready, they're four or five, go ahead and start teaching that skill. I love that. Yeah. Cause then there's not that anxiety, mm -hmm. um, that a, a problem brings with it because right. you almost have this, you know, anxiousness. I've got to solve it. I've got to figure it out. Yeah. And, um, and that doesn't help when you haven't, brought that to fluency, like you were talking about, Brandon. Right. I mean, yeah, you want that problem solving process to be fluent as well. And, um, you know, and if our kids knew, you know, that the wisest people ask the most questions, <laughs> you know, right. and, and that's the truth. And um, I think we think that the smartest people have all the answers. They don't, they just know where to go. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and I, I do think it, and I've seen the same thing with my son on the spectrum too. He doesn't want to ask. He thinks that intuitively he has to know. And I, I grew up the same way. I remember my dad doing the same thing. So, you know, it's just, um, it's something that the brain just kind of locks in on that and that you, you have to know the answers, but the more that you keep repeating that and, um, and teaching them that there's, there's so much we all don't know. <laughs> so, um, so I want to give you guys some time to talk a little bit about your new project, um, the Transition and Employment Center, and how that came about, where parents can find you, how they can connect if they want more information. And I'm going to put your, your website up here. And so they, 
Um, Wendy and Brandy have been talking about social motion skills, and so their website, the standard website, is socialmotionskills.org. Um, but um, front slash um, TEC underscore lab um, and, and front slash again is where you can find their TEC center. So, um, so what's this all about and how did it come about? I want to know. <laughs> This is Brandy's brainchild, and um, she has brought this to fruition in our community, so um, I want her to tell you all about it. Awesome. Um, so the tech center came about, um, of course, like I said, I love data, data-driven instruction. Um, one of the things that we find so often with kiddos that um, are looking for transition services is they really don't know what they want. So um, like Wendy said earlier, so many of our kids have never worked jobs. They don't have any work experience. Um, you know, they don't have really an idea of what they want to do, or they come in with really um, unreal expectations. And so the Transition and Employability Center is a hands-on vocational assessment that takes place in a simulated work environment. So the kids get to come in they have to clock in and clock out every day, just like they're going to work. They, um, the teachers are not teachers, they're supervisors. Um, they get to explore hands-on vocational tasks in five different areas. So computer, um, computer technology, business marketing, consumer services, construction, industrial, and processing and production. So um, there's about 200 and 260 something tasks that they get to explore. Um, we really get to find out where their strengths are. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at um, what skills do they already have? We're looking at how competitive are they in the skill? Can they complete a task in a rate that's gonna be competitive with someone else? Mm -hmm. um, and then we're also assessing their work behaviors. So a lot of our kids that come to, well, the young adults that come to us, it's not that they can't do the jobs, um, it's the behaviors in the workplace. So maybe they can't take constructive criticism or maybe they don't have the stamina to do a job. Um, so what we're really doing is building a portfolio of their accommodations that they might need. Ah, that's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, like you said, they don't, they haven't been in those environments, they don't know. Mm -hmm. And when you can document that, when you can track it with that data, then it's easier to ask for those accommodations within the workforce. And so you're, yes. you're providing so, an intermediary step. And after they've completed the assessment, they get a really nice report back that you can take to your transition director, you can take to your transition services um, coordinators, whoever you're working with, that gives them an idea of exactly what skills they have and an idea of what types of training they might need to move forward and be successful. Um, so really taking the guesswork out of transition and um, using data to help our kids and our young adults be more successful um, in that transition. Super exciting as a parent because now I get this report and I'm like, oh my gosh, these are the skills my child has. These are their interests mm -hmm. and these are the barriers to behavior that are going to possibly impede them in successful competitive employment. So right. I'm still in high school. Now I'm going to my counselors or my homeschoolers or um, wherever we're working on. And you've still got those really formative years to start kind of chipping away and, and tackling these problems, mm -hmm. working on internships, getting volunteer um, job positions that really um, hone into and focus on the direction. This is like the, right. you've been given yeah. the light at the end of the tunnel. And so mm -hmm. we're here and transition is there, but now um, you've kind of got a map of what needs to happen between in the next year or in the next two years. And um, we found that it's been incredibly valuable and satisfying and um, I think um, satisfying for parents because they're like, oh my gosh, we finally have some data. Mm -hmm. No longer the opinion of, well, I think my kid's good at this or, you know, uh, my right. kid is, is great on the computer because they can, you know, hit, 30 Google sites in 30 seconds. Therefore, they, 
they're going to go work for Google. You know, it's like, well, let's figure out, you know, how does that really work in the real world? So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Wait. what age group or do you recommend this program for? Um, we start taking them at age 14 which is okay. the transition age. So about seventh grade, age 14. Um, and as far as upper age range, it, just any age, it doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah, the assessment itself takes about 80 hours. Um, so it's not a it's not a short assessment, um, but we work with the families um, typically about two to three days a week for three hours a day is what we recommend. So it usually takes about eight to nine weeks to complete the assessment. Okay. All right. And this is um, super for um, families who um, are in the homeschool situation because hopefully you can find flexibility in the day. So like Brandy said, you could come in the mornings for one or two days a week or in the afternoons. Um, so really the, the tech center is there and it's open with flexibility. Um, for those who homeschool and have, you know, flexible hours in their hours. Yeah. And, and you guys are located in Houston, Texas. I want to just let our, our audience know that because we, we do have a, an international reach. So, um, so if you don't, you're not local, um, <laughs> but there is a lot of things on your website, socialmotionskills.org that parents can take advantage of remotely too. And, and also, can you talk a little bit about um, your other product that in, in Quentro, um, just so I don't have that website up, but if you just want to. So, you know, kind of in the new world, we're um, really always trying to figure out how do we best serve our families and how do we spread the reach and the knowledge of what we have kind of amassed and learned over these years. And so um, Encuentro is kind of our, I guess, um, baby in incubation. And um, so it is a video based product, um, primarily for those not in the Houston area who are not able to physically come to our center because we believe in in-person services and the tech mm -hmm. center that we subscribe for you um, will not work virtually. Um, and Quintro is um, really meant to be an extension of the learning opportunities of social skills and um, parent training opportunities for parents who do not live in the local area. So we're really excited to um, have learned what we did. It's, um, it's kind of been a trial project. We were, um, working in this space before COVID. COVID mm -hmm. um, actually proved to us um, the, the value and the need for mm -hmm. virtual mm -hmm. services. And so now we're really um, looking maybe to take it a step further um, mm -hmm. with the goal really of getting out to the communities who don't have access to resources like social motion skills in Houston. We live mm -hmm. in an urban area. Um, right there's a lot of families who can come to us, but you know what? What about those who live with Brandy? Tell them where you came from. I mean, yeah. I'm from a, supposed to do right. Very, exactly. very small rural East Texas town. And mm -hmm. I was the only BCBA within a hundred mile radius for a very long time. And parents have to drive for hours to receive services. Exactly. So that's mm -hmm. kind of our heartbeat with um, with Enquintro is reaching out to those that they'll never be able to come to a center um, like we have available in Houston. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Or else a lot of parents will travel for, you know, and, and stay somewhere and get the services, you know, that they mm -hmm. need within a week or two and stay at a hotel and then go back. It becomes so costly. And um, yes, those rural families really do struggle and we lived we lived so in the sticks for a long time <laughs> so i know <laughs> COVID taught us that this is possible and um it really forced a lot of people up the learning curve that they can access services like this so there's a lot of things in the market we're waiting to change the acceptance of telehealth the acceptance of teleservices um mm -hmm. but um yeah so that's kind of where we're moving um, we're still piloting classes we're still trying to learn um, how we can take our offerings um, wider into more. So if anybody has questions, mm -hmm. anybody outside the local market has questions about our services, we, we would love to um, be able to help you. Yeah, awesome. So, and, and if I'll share those links in the YouTube description as well.
well, and you can find um, both of their their organizations on the Sped Homeschool website too. So, um, so yeah, that's awesome. Well, thank you, ladies, so much. This was so informative and just filled with so much wisdom. That um, yes, we need to be thinking about transitioning all the way through and um, and raising our kids and and schooling them and just um, not overcompensating. So um, lots lots of Lots of good information to take away. Um, I appreciate you both sharing. And, uh, Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Well, awesome. So, and thank you, viewers, for, for hanging on with us. You um, didn't have any questions or comments tonight, but I, I know you're out there because I see how many people are watching. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm just quiet this evening, which is just fine. Um, we want to thank also Bookshark for sponsoring this episode of um, Sped Home or sorry, Empowering Homeschool Conversations. We changed our name at the beginning of the year and I'm still having a hard time <laughs> switching over with that. Um, but um, so yeah, we um, are done with our month on IEPs and as Brandy was talking about data and tracking, well, guess what? Next month, we're gonna be talking about data and tracking and planning <laughs> and organizing and all of those things that you're like, ah, I don't want to do this, but it's necessary. And and so we've got some guests coming up in the month of March. They're going to help you with those things and give you some tips and tricks and um, just how do I do this? Um, and so we're launching next week and um, one of our guests is going to talk about um, organizing your classroom, your homeschool classroom for success. And um, she actually teaches and coaches parents on how to do this for homeschooling kids with um, special needs. So i um, excited about, about that topic and about that new um, venture. Um, we have coming up as well that I want to share with you is that we have just launched some webinars on a brand new platform called Empowered Homeschool Network. And um, so you can actually visit that at Empowered Homeschool dot org and and you can see those webinars there and we're gonna be adding a lot more to that site it's, this is just the beginning um but on the site empoweredhomeschool.org you'll see what it's going to be um, we've got listed on there our vision for that for that site and just how we're going to bring you together with partners like wendy and brandy and um and let them be able to teach you their in an expert way, courses, master classes, and a whole bunch more. So, um, so we're excited for that. So, um, so thanks for everybody for joining us tonight, um, and um, just continuing to um, to listen to our broadcast. I know there's a lot of you that listen to our podcast, so we appreciate you downloading us every week. And um, we'll see you again next week, right here, same place, same time, um, eight o'clock central, and um, on Tuesday night. So. Have a great night, everybody, and thanks again, Wendy and Brandy. <laughs> Bye, Peggy. Thanks. Have you ever attempted to read the entire Bible? Did you do it, or did you only make it part way? I'm John Stonge, and I host a podcast that will make it possible for you to make it through the entire Bible, one chapter at a time. I've been hosting the Chapter a Day Audio Bible Podcast since 2015, and every single day of the week, I read one chapter of Scripture, then follow that up with a time of prayer. And if you're looking for daily insights and inspiration directly from God's Word, I hope you'll give the Chapter a Day Audio Bible a listen. You can find it at lifeaudio.com or on your favorite podcasting app.